You know, I'm going to speak a lesson uh, based on the final lesson I preached in Salt Lake City. We started a congregation there about four years ago, and we planted some uh, uh, a good, sound congregation there, and we pray and hope that that continues to grow, and, and I kind of miss those brethren. They were special to me. Uh, we came to this area because our daughter lives in Marion with her three children, and then I have a son that lives in Ohio with three little girls, and so we wanted to be closer. My father lived in Canada. He just recently passed away, and Christy's father lives in Chicago, so we thought it would be good to get back to this general area, but guess what? We're not from Indiana. It's like, what? how did you come to Indiana? Well, I had heard a lot of good things about Indiana Brethren over the years. I've known several gospel preachers from Indiana and good friends of mine. And uh, so I knew there must be some wonderful Christians grounded in the truth here. And I'm really glad to meet you all. The last sermon that I preached at Salt Lake, uh, I wanted to leave with a final word of encouragement to them. And I could think of none other than the wonderful statement found in the Bible where it says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? Keep ourselves in the love of God. Now, it means that the Bible is teaching us that God will help us and he has the power he, uh, we can rely on the strength of God, and that's especially shown for us here in verse 24, that in verse 24 of Jude, and we're going to be looking and doing kind of a, an exegesis of Jude, the book of Jude. So open your Bible to that book of Jude, and we'll be studying a lot of passages in that particular book. And uh, it's a one-chapter book, so it's easy to find, isn't it? Just open there to Jude, and, and we'll see. But in the Bible, it says that he is able to keep you from stumbling. And so we look to the strength and to the love of God and the power of God. He is able to keep us. Don't ever forget that. We draw our strength from God. God is there for us. He will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able, but will provide a way of escape. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, the Bible says. We have the power to overcome. And even in that verse 24, it says, he is able to present you blameless before the presence of the glory of God with great joy. But also in this verse that we're looking here, it says that we're to keep ourselves in the love of God. Now, this is kind of a, a powerful verse because it's a loaded statement. Within that one verse, it's interjoined with the obedience of Jesus, isn't it? In other words, no greater love could be given for us than for Jesus to come to this low land of sin and sorrow and live as he lived a blameless and pure life and die on that cruel cross of Calvary for you and for me. And so we think of his great love, his great sacrificial and selfless love, but then it's joined with the idea, isn't it, that we then are to keep ourselves in the love of God. God loves us more than we can understand, and yet we must love God back by keeping his commandments, and as it says, keeping ourselves in the love of God. And so when we first look at this verse, even though God has done his part and we can have salvation through his blood, we must focus on keeping ourselves in the love of God. So I could think of no greater statement than to leave those brethren with. Brethren, here we are. We're, we're, we're focused on you. We've started a congregation. And what I want to say as I leave is keep yourselves in the love of God. 
Now, this expression, keep yourself, is, is noted here in Acts 15, verse 29. It says to abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. 1 John 5, verse 21, that's, the, that's our verse that we're studying. Keep ourselves in, from idols. Or This is 1 John, actually, verse 5, 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And then Jude 1, verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. That's the greatest thing that we can do. We need to focus on that because there's a lot of things trying to take us away from that. There's a lot of temptations. In fact, Jude is going to be mentioning some of these things. But you know, when it says keep ourselves in the love of God, there's a divine definition for that. There's a divine explanation for that. And so if you turn in your Bible to John chapter 15 and verse 9, it says, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Well, we ask ourselves then, how do we abide in the love of Jesus? And it says in John 15 and verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Very simple, isn't it? Definition is it says we can keep God's commandment and abide in his love. And there's another verse that goes along with that, and that is in 1 John 2, in verse 5. This is just as clear. It says, The love of God is perfected in the one who keeps God's word. That's it. <laughs> it's kind of simple, isn't it? Where it says, Keep God's word, and the love of God will be perfected in you. And so I want to study a little more about that as the lesson unfolds. In fact, Jude is very concerned with Christians. And he's especially in, uh, concerned with these brethren that he's writing. Because he's writing to tell them to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. He's saying, you know what, we're going to have to contend contend earnestly. What does that really mean? <clears throat> Another translation says, contend strenuously. We're going to have to really focus on contending for, as we talk about the faith, what is that? God's truth, God's will, the faith that is revealed within the gospel, how to be and how to live. And the Bible says, and by the way, there's no latter-day revelations today. Excludes Mormonism, excludes the Jehovah Witnesses, it excludes the Seventh-day Adventists. All of these things do that because it says there was the faith which was once for all, one time for all time, delivered to the saints. And remember, Paul said, if anyone preach any other gospel to you, then that which I preached to you, let him be accursed. He says, yea, if I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then what I have preached to you, let him be accursed. Paul couldn't change it. An angel from heaven couldn't change it. We have to follow this faith, which was one time for all time delivered to the saints. <clears throat> well, once again, this word contend earnestly, it's kind of an allusion to the Grecian games. They had sports and they had competitions like the Olympics, you might say. And uh, it was saying you contend just like you would contend in the Olympics or in the Grecian games. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24, it says, <clears throat> Do you not know that those who run in a race run, but one receives the prize? One run in such a way that you may obtain it. And the idea then that Jude is trying to convey to you and I is that we do all we can 
to hold fast the principles of pure and undefiled and unadulterated religion and maintaining those principles against all opposers. Anyone who would thwart the faith, bring into it sinfulness or sinful things, as we're going to see in a moment, we need to do everything we can to hold fast to those moral virtues, to hold on to holiness and purity and righteousness. That is our calling as Christians. That's how we shine as a light to the world, isn't it? Because we're different. We're going to see that we're spiritual. That's how we're different. And so we hold on to these things. Later in the book, Jude reveals different occasions where people strayed from the will of God. And the consequence of that strain, it inevitably led to their ruination. Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels from heaven fell. Talks about the Israelites falling in the wilderness. And so there is a great danger. Don't let anyone say, once saved, always saved. There's a great danger that we fall and be eternally lost. We don't want that. And essentially, Jude warns us and describes for us those who are perverting the grace of God for immorality. We're a pure people. We do not want to be immoral. And Jude said, certain men have crept in among you unnoticed, ungodly ones who were designated long ago for condemnation. They turned the grace of our God into a license for immorality. If anybody ever tells you that God's grace will cover your sins, you can just live in your sin, that is the deception that Satan would want. They've crept in and they're turning the grace of God into a license for immorality. Similar to the question that was asked in the book of Romans, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer was, God forbid. We have had our sins washed away. We rise to walk in newness of life. We're to live this wonderfully pure and holy life. Don't let anyone ever tell you that we can practice immorality and be saved by God. It's just not going to happen. And it says they turn the grace of our God into a license for immorality and they deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now that's pretty sad, really. And this, this would stir anybody to write about that. And if we have anyone in the church that thinks that we can live sinful or immoral, that's a great danger to those brethren. Because we know we're to contend for this wonderful faith of purity. <coughs> but you know what? We had the scripture reading. And the scripture reading tells us of a hope that we can have beyond this world and that we can have this quality of life and don't have to compromise ourselves. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith, pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And so as he concludes the book, he gives this message of hope for you and I that we can overcome. Now, I want you to notice, though, uh, that also he is able to keep us from falling. And don't forget that aspect also in verse 24, that God will help us overcome these things. But also, he says in verse 17 and 18, so look there in your Bible at verse 17 and 18, he says, I want to call to remembrance something. He said, but you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord. How they told you that there would be mockers, scoffers, in other words, in the last day, in the last time, 
who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. There's some words that we need to pay attention to, and that is ungodly. Ungodly. This is not godlike. They're ungodly lusts. Now, I want us to focus in on, it says, the apostles. Well, if we turn over to 2 Peter, Peter wrote this. He was an apostle, wasn't he? He was one of the main apostles. And he says in 2 Peter 3, verse 1, This second epistle, beloved, I write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Because he goes on to say, In the last day, mockers will come with mocking, following after their own lusts. And I'm not afraid of mockers, by the way. I'm not afraid of scoffers. They can scoff all they want because I have a faith that's grounded. And I know whom I have believed, just like Paul said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him until that day. And so I have that confidence. I've always said, and young people, I know people are trying to turn you away from a belief in God. And they're trying to teach this idea of evolution. And they mock you as if you have faith and and, and all you believe in. Let me tell you, there is nothing more unbelievable than the theory of evolution. I've always said it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in a superior, intelligent God beyond our understanding, really, that has always existed. As if matter has always existed and somehow exploded. And now you have everything the way you see it so greatly designed as the eyeball and the human brain and all of the things that we see in humankind and everything in such order and precision And yet that just happened by a big bang. I tell you, it takes more faith to believe in that than it does to believe in God. And you know what? A lot of people and scientists are coming around to that conclusion once they discover DNA. And they said, if that isn't a fingerprint by God, I don't know what is, that within each and every one of us, we have a unique DNA, a unique order. And folks, they say that's the signature of God. God has written His signature on each and every one of us by giving us such unique DNA. But anyway, what I want to focus on is your pure minds. I stir you up in your pure mind by way of remembrance. Well, what does it mean to have a pure mind? I'll tell you what, that's a lot different than the world we live in with a perverted mind, with ungodliness. One person said, and I want to quote from this individual, as persons in businesses who hold up the goods they are buying to the sun to see if they can observe any fault in them. We look at that vessel and we say, are there any cracks in them? We look at that and we we see no cracks. So such may be said to be sincere or pure, who, who, who the test of light has proven to be without fault. Now, folks, that's supposed to be you and I. In other words, those whose pure heart, their life and their conversation, whose principles and practices will bear the test of light, such are sincere, who are like honey without wax and fine flour without leaven, that have no mixture of corruption in doctrine, in life, or manners, whose grace is genuine and right, whose faith is unfeigned, whose love to God and Christ and one another is without dissimulation. That's what God wants you and I to be. Have that love that is so devoted, that true McCoy. We want to be pure like that. Some have rendered pure minds with the word sincere. 
We want to be sincere about our religion. And may designate the sincerity of their hearts in the worship of God, in the doctrines of Christ, and to one another, and of the grace of the Spirit of God in them, as that their faith was unfeigned, their hope without hypocrisy, their love without dissimulation, and their repentance real and genuine. Now that's the pure mind. And if anybody's wanting a concept of who a Christian is, then just think of it that way. I'm devoted to God, and we're going to see that. And so he's talking to them, and anything that would be threatening our pure and our wholesome values and morality is what he's guarding against. Now, Jude says in verse 13, and by the way, this is a verse that kind of expels what I've just said, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. You and I, I focus on that. We must approve that which is excellent and be that way in our heart and in our mind and totally devoted to God. And it goes on to say that very thing because it says in Jude 1, that these people that are teaching lusts and ungodly lusts, it says these are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the spirit. Another translation says, these be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. And another rendering of this verse, these are ones who cause divisions who are worldly, and devoid of the Spirit. Well, really, what is that saying then? Well, I hope this chart clears this. When it says they are sensual people, and you can go into the Greek word sensual, and do you know what that Greek word mouse, uh, he, he, he gave us the definition. To be a sensual person is to be animalistic. In other words, living like an animal rather than a spiritual person. Our world is given over to bestiality. And people wax worse and worse. Ungodliness leads to more ungodliness. Have you ever heard of the old movie Animal House? Well, that's in my generation. I remember that movie called Animal House. It was, it was about wild and riotous parties, wine women and all of that. And it just is such an ungodly world of perversion. The Bible says they're sensual people. In other words, they're animal-like. In the New Testament, animal as distinguished from spiritual substance, occupied with mere animal things, carnality. And of course, Jude 3 says, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. People without the law of God will go that direction. We wonder why the world is the way it is right now, because they've taken God out of schools, they've taken God out of society. For the most part now, people are evolutionists. And look at the world and the chaos that we're living in right now. Because people are just mere beasts. Rapes and all sorts of things that we don't even want to express because they're so evil. But as it says, these people are not having the spirit. What does it mean to have the spirit? Well, I'll tell you what it means to God is spirit. And remember, it says those that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. When we talk about God, we're talking about spiritual things. So it says here in the chart, he who gives himself up to the body is fleshly, but he who by communion with God's spirit gives himself up to the noble, noble life is spiritual. Jude uses this idea, the wisdom that is from above is pure and peaceable and gentle and willing to yield, full of mercies and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. 
If there's anything that I can encourage you all to be, it is that is spiritually minded. That idea is that we are to seek after a Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to define that because sometimes when people read the Holy Spirit in the Bible, they're always thinking about God, the Holy Spirit. Now, there is the third part of the, of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. But in many passages, when it talks about the Holy Spirit, it's talking about you and I having a Holy Spirit connected with God. Remember, it says that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't mean that he had the Holy Spirit dwelling in him in some kind of personal way. He was full of Holy Spirit, God's nature, God's way. These people that are carnally minded, they do not seek after God's holy nature. They do not aspire for God's holiness or the Spirit's message in His Word. And by the way, the Bible says if we do not have the Spirit of holiness in us, then whosoever is none of Christ's Spirit does not belong to Him. And that's mentioned for us in uh, Romans chapter 8. And you can look at that in verse 5. If you will, you don't have the spirit of God dwelling in you. That's not a literal dwelling. That means God's nature. It means that we are close to God, that we are holding fast to God and his will and his nature in our lives. Folks, I cannot stress to you enough that a Christian is to be wholly a spiritual man. If someone were to say to you, well, what is a Christian? I would say to them, we are a spiritual man. We believe in the things of God. We believe in the nature of God. We believe in the fruit of the Spirit. We believe in living a life focused on heaven, focused on spiritual things. And we need to say to ourselves, oh to be holy, a spiritual person. That's our way of life. Well, folks, the Bible goes on and says some things about this, but we're not going to have time to get into that. I see our time is quickly getting away. But the spiritual man is mindful of the things of God. That's really what a spiritual man is. And Paul said that was his mission in, in preaching the gospel. If we have sown spiritual things, it is a great thing we reap your material things. Later on, there's a great verse that tells us that he who is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Why is that? Because the spiritual person is not a carnal person. A carnal person, that's why the law was given. Because men are carnal, and the law was to teach us not to do those things. But you know what? If I said to you, if you're a spiritual person, then guess what? You're above the law. Why is that? Because God doesn't sin. A spiritual man is not to sin. In other words, the Bible goes on and says in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, against such there is no law. There's no law. You can't violate any law when you're walking in the Spirit of God. Isn't that wonderful? So get yourself up on that plane. Get ourselves up on that spiritual level. Our focus with God as a spiritual person. And we won't wrestle with carnality. Because our mind is focused on God. You know, the Bible teaches us, doesn't it? That we walk by the Spirit, and it says, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Just think of it that way. I'm going to walk by the Spirit. I'm going to walk by God's will. His way is spiritual. That's the way to everlasting life, right? But unfortunately, people are not realizing the great conflict. And this is where they're drawn into these carnal things, this ungodliness. 
For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not under law. Well, folks, there's a great war between the flesh and the spirit. And I want you to, to be mindful of that. You know, people, young people especially, in your direction of life, focus on the spirit. Don't focus on the flesh or carnality. Focus on holiness and purity, that pure mind that we're talking about. I know who I want to be. Now, when I was a teenager, I got messed up. And I thought I wanted to focus on worldliness, but guess what? I went through a spell, and I realized that was so empty. And that was so poor and sad, and that kind of diminished my soul. And it, it took me away from the happiness of God and the focus that I have in God. And I came back to the Lord. Because you know what I want to be? I want to be a spiritual man. Do you want to be that way, a spiritual person? Because that's the way to heaven, is to be a spiritual person. Now, I want to conclude, and, and give me five more minutes, because I'm going to try to make these points very fast, and that is that the Bible tells us how we can keep ourselves in the love of God. And it says it in these verses, in verses 20 and 21. Beloved... Build yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit and keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, the first thing we not need to realize as he's telling them to keep yourself in the love of God is that we need to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. Now, when you think of build yourself up in the most holy faith, what is that saying to you and I? Well, let's look at this chart. In your most holy faith. What does holiness mean? From this side of the chart, it says, that which is pure and moral and blameless and religion, holiness. Build yourself up in that holy Focus our mind on the pure things, right? Meditate on these things. But then it goes on to say your most holy faith. Well, what is that? In our moral convictions, in our religious truth, especially reliance upon Christ for salvation, the system of religion, <laughs> the truth itself. <clears throat> so we have a holy faith. Isn't that wonderful? Just focus on that. Say to yourself as young people, I want to live in our holy faith. Don't just read that so fast and say, I don't know what that means. It means the purity and the morality and the blamelessness that is holy. That's the, the part of God we want along with the convictions that we have. But where does that come from? Where are we going to be able to get that? Well, I'll tell you what. The Bible says we're going to get it from the Word of God. You know, you must build yourselves up in that. But can we, and, and maybe this is time to take a personal analysis, because it says, but you. It doesn't say, but others. It says, but you build yourselves up in the most holy faith. Can we look at our lives and say that we are building ourselves up in holy faith? That's, that's really wonderful, isn't it? Because, you know, we have a job ahead of us, and that is to build upon holiness and faith. Jude wants us to make an evaluation of our lives and say, are we building ourselves up in the most holy faith? Are we making an effort to build our lives deeper and stronger in the most holy faith? You know, knowing God's teaching and applying those teachings to our life is necessary. 
This is why we as a church focus upon a heavy emphasis on knowing God's word. Because how can you know about the will of God without reading the will of God in the Bible? And so what we need to do is we need to study the word of God to know his ways. You know what the Bible says? How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. And then look at verse 40. Your word is very pure. Therefore, your servant loves it. That's why we study our Bible. To understand the way of God. And to follow that nature of God in our lives. But also... How do we keep ourselves in the love of God? The Bible says by praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, folks, I don't want us to go crazy here. Because that's what man does a lot of time. They read that Holy Spirit and they think, so am I supposed to pray in the Holy Spirit? How in the world do I do that? Is this the Holy Spirit possessing me and dwelling in me? And I pray in the Holy Spirit? Folks, look at the words. And sometimes spirit does not need to be. A lot of times when they translated the Bible, they always put a capital letter to spirit. It's not saying that. It's saying praying in your Holy Spirit, with your Holy Spirit. Notice, again, holy is pure, morally blameless, or religion, and... The spirit means the spiritual nature of Christ. Play in the Holy Spirit higher than the highest angels and equal to God, the divine nature of Christ, a divine bestowed spiritual frame, characteristics of true believers. You know, prayer is a spiritual act. Absolutely. That's why prayer is so important. Because prayer connects us to God, and that's the level of life we want to live on. We want to pray to a spiritual God and focus on spiritual things, and ungodly people don't pray. Only when disaster strikes, and then all of a sudden they're saying a lot of prayers, right? But do you think those prayers are really heard? And the Bible even says, God does not hear the prayers of sinners. Why? Because they're not spiritual. But you know, you and I in the spirit is a popular way of saying, I'm looking to our spiritual father and I'm talking to God who is spirit and I'm one with him in the spirit. I'm united. What did we say? We're a spiritual man. And so pray in the spirit to God. You are on that level with God. We can pray to God. And you know, in, in Ephesians 6, verse 18, it doesn't say, but this, uh, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So it took out the word holy, but we know that holy is pure and blameless. It just pray in the Spirit. What does that mean? That means in the realm of godliness, being spiritual, we're praying to God that way. This is not some sort of special prayer of the Holy Spirit. What this is, is a prayer that should always be looking godlike. In other words, your prayers are driven by the will of God. Your prayers are spiritually focused. And your prayers are for your spiritual welfare and spiritual strength. Pray in the Holy Spirit. That's right. And there's one more way that we keep ourselves in the love of God. By the way, that praying is great, isn't it? Because when you're talking to God, you're walking with God. And that's the nature of a Christian. But also it says in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And so what's our focus we're waiting or we're looking for the mercy of our Lord that leads to eternal life. I don't know when that might be. 
Recently, I've been drawn to the corridor of death by the death of my own father. And I tell you, my father was a spiritual man in his life. And when I looked at him, I knew my dad is no longer here in, in his body. His spirit has gone to his maker. And folks, it's good for us to go into the house of mourning to see the end. Because one day you will die. <laughs> <clears throat> and if you're spiritual, then you will go to heaven where your father is. You will dwell in that spiritual land. But the Bible teaches about the punishment for the wicked, right? That's what Jude is trying to say. Don't let anyone draw you away into ungodliness and sensual things and the debased nature of this world. Remember your spirituality. Keep yourselves in the love of God. God loves you. And our focus then is to keep ourselves in that love. And so what this is really saying is to keep our eyes on where we are going. Think about what you're waiting for. I'm waiting for eternal life. Think about what you're looking for. I'm looking for eternal life. Think about what you're wanting. I'm wanting a home in heaven. Because you know what? I sometimes view myself as really connecting with the young people. And you might look at me and say, how could this old man with this gray hair say he connects to the young people? You know why? Because I remember when I was young. And I remember the world and its wickedness seeking out our young people. And I still have a great desire and love for our young people. And throughout my life, I've devoted myself to mentoring young people. And I've worked at juvenile delinquency homes. And I've been a foster or a mentor to young people. All in an effort to teach them the better way. If your life is getting a little bit astray by the draw of the world, focus yourself on spiritual things. Come back. Remember where you're going to go. And you know what? If you take your eye off the road, if you're not looking at the road to where you're going, guess what? It's like the person with a cell phone. Now, folks, I tell you, I hate to admit it, and I have done that. Christy knows. And she says, get your eyes back on the road. Well, what am I doing? I'm in the other lane. That's what you're doing. I'm swerving all over the road. I said, it'll only take a second, but you know how fast we're traveling? And that second is like wandering. Before you know it, you're hitting those bumps. And Christy always knows when I hit those bumps, I'm not looking at the road. Folks, keep your eye on heaven. Keep your eye on heaven. Now, that's the last thing I want to say to you and I. And I appreciate you being a little bit understanding, drawing the lesson to a little longer than it should be. But folks, I tell you what. This is an encouraging verse right here. In verse 21, it says, God is able to keep you from stumbling. So God will be there for you. Keep praying in your Holy Spirit. Keep praying. Keep your mind set on spiritual things. And say, I'm not going to go over into carnality to an animal-like way of life. I am higher than that. You know, the Bible says God has seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're not on this low land of oh, the sins you can't even speak of, of that are in the world today. And how people mistreat people. But we're on this road to heaven. And folks, the greatest part is he is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of God. You know what? Do you want to be blameless before the presence of God? Well, you need to be washed in his blood. You need to repent of your sins and uh, any kind of debaseness that you've been a participant in. Worldly world, words that are said that are coarse and horrible to the human ears have almost become standard. In our world today, I want to be a spiritual man. 
I want you to leave here today thinking, I'm spiritual. I'm following after the nature of my God. God is spirit. And that's the way to live in life. And folks, if you keep your eye on the road to heaven, and if you say, I know there's a God that will wash me from my sins. If we repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. You know, Saul wanted to know what to do. And he says, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. And what? Wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. To rise to walk in newness of life. That's the new birth. Then, folks, you say, I want to live for God. In His nature. I want to be like God. That is the spiritual man.